Hi class, today we're going to discuss Chapter 2, Nutritional Epidemiology, um, and its evaluation on cardiovascular disease. So in science, how we come to any conclusion that there's a cause and effect or there's a relationship between two variables, we need to do research. And this chapter really talks about how do we do that research in a meaningful rel way that's reliable, which means um, Every time we do that same research, we're going to get the same result and that it's valid that we actually know what we're measuring and that we're measuring the correct things so we can actually make causal relationships um, between these variables. And for example, uh, this chapter's main focus is cardiovascular disease and the type of experiments we would do to discuss that. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in all developed nations. Um, but the interesting thing is what we know about cardiovascular disease and what we've gleaned through research is that it has a direct relationship with hypokinetic behavior, which means lack of movement, sedentary behavior, and the types of foods we eat. Um, and what's really important is that we make nutritional claims based off science, based off research. Um, nutritional claims are a dime a dozen. You know this because right now keto is really cool, but you know, a year ago it was paleo and pretty soon vegan's going to get cool. It's pretty getting cool now. Um, you know, so it, it always, it's, it's, that's, that's always about the money. That's always about the selling point, not about whether it's actually good for you or not. When we look at nutritional research, we need to determine what's actually scientifically based, not money based, and what's actually good. Because at that point, then we can develop behavior prevention and policy to prevent things like the leading cause of death worldwide. So experimental studies, most powerful study that we can do, it's where we have two variables and we can manipulate one variable and not manipulate it for another group. So for example, if we had an experimental study in eight week outpatient feeding study. The control would be the typical American diet and then the variable we would manipulate would be that diet, right? And then so at that point we could then determine did diet have an effect and in this case on hypertension, does diet have an effect on hypertension? And it does. There, there's, it, there's been numerous, numerous studies. This is just an example. We completely know that diets high in fruits and vegetables, low in dairy, low in meat, um, certainly uh, low sodium diet, things like that, have a direct causal relationship with hypertension. And so um, it's through experimental studies where we can truly manipulate a study that um, we can make those determinations. Uh, the drawback with experimental studies is they're hard, right? Um, this is an outpatient feeding study. That means you have to control everything a person eats, which means it's really hard to do it outpatient. Typically, we have to do it inpatient, right? Because you have to truly monitor all behavior in order to be able to say, yes, it was the food. Because if you're not controlling it, all we know is like John over there is sneaking cake at night and he's on the DASH diet, which would say, well, we're going to be low in added sugars and we are going to be, you know, no high fat saturated stuff. And so these experimentals, as powerful as they are, they are hard to manage. Now we go to observational studies. These are really nice because they're a snapshot in time, right? We're just basically observing the population. Cross-sectional makes it really nice because we can evaluate multiple populations right? This is really helpful for when we want to ask a question. A hypothesis, a lot of times we think that's a question. A hypothesis is really a statement. A, you know, um, a high fat, high sugar diet will raise your uh, body fat percentage. That's, that's a statement. That's a hypothesis. But prior to getting to that hypothesis, we have questions, right? And so this is where we kind of ask questions and we do observational studies because this is how we generate what our statement is going to be. It's limited. We can't determine whether the exposure or the outcome came first, right? We're, we're merely viewing. We're viewing because it's a great first step. The really nice thing is we can do lots of people at one time. It's not as controlled. It's not as expensive. And it does actually provide us lots of good information. An example of this is a children's sample of children and adults in the United States. We gather their health information through physical examinations, through interviews. We do a cross-sectional technique to examine the data. And what do we find out? Between added sugar intake and cardiovascular disease risks, such as HDL and LDL, we know that if you have a high sugar diet, your LDL is through the roof. 
And if you have um, a high sugar, high fat diet, your, LD, your HDL will also be low. And what's good here? So we know that our LDL is good, or is bad, excuse me, and our HDL is good. We want very low LDL, we want high HDL. Okay, so it's good to do observational studies because we can kind of see that with lots of data. A case control study is where we compare exposure to a disease or condition or cases. So the thing about a case is a case is not something we can create. I can't give you osteoporosis from a calcium deficiency by denying you calcium. That would actually be bad. That would be amoral and something that would not be allowed in research, right? And so what we can do though is we can study people who have disease or do not have disease and even though we, we're not manipulating disease, we can try to determine if there are things related to that disease. Strength, it lets us study diseases that we typically can't study or, or really, um, from an ethical standpoint, can't create. Um, and then it allows us to kind of see uh, what could be some causal factors or what what relationships could exist. And when I say causal factors and relationships, I should piece that out a little bit more. A causal relationship is called a correlation, or excuse me, a, re a relationship between two variables is called a correlation. A correlation just means that there's a relationship. We don't know which variable causes the other variable to change. We just know that there's a relationship. A causal factor is when we can actually test as one variable um, causes the other variable. And we can typically only do that through um, experimental studies. Okay, so here's just another um, example of an observational case control study, right? When we're looking at alcohol consumption, and what we actually found is alcohol consumption does actually tend to lower a thrombolism, a venous thrombolism, which is basically a blood clot. Um, which is why m many diets recommend one to two drinks a day, depending on if you're a female or a male. It's for males, it's two. For females, it's one, um, because it tends to be slightly a blood thinner and seems to have a beneficial outcome. Now, the research does not suggest you should start drinking if you don't drink, but it does suggest that a little alcohol tends to be healthy. So um, a cohort study is where you get a group of people um, that's very specific and you follow those participants over time. Um, these also can be considered longitudinal studies because of the over time, over the longevity of the study. Um, what's really nice about this is you can study um, as we age, you can study continual behavior. So for example, in a snapshot study, we only know what you're doing right now. But in an observational study, if I watched you eat a certain way over 10 years or watched you um, exercise in a certain way over 10 years, how would that tell me a lot about how aging might occur and the long-term effects of that behavior? So it really lets us measure disease incidence, not just the prevalence, for example, the distance between incidence and prevalence, right? Um, they are hard to do, they're expensive over time, and they also have attrition. Attrition means that they, people leave the study, and that can be hard because if you're following a group of people for 10 or 20 years, um, you know that some people are going to end up bowing out of the study. Here's another example in your textbook of a cohort study and some of the benefits that came out of that. So a diet assessment, a 24-hour recall, can really be helpful because participants typically remember what they ate the day before, right? And so what we would tend to do is ask them to measure. We would do it through, administer it through interview, um, typically with a person on the phone. A person on the phone can actually be a little bit more helpful because we tend to be a little bit more honest with someone who we can't look in their eyes because when we're talking to someone, maybe we don't want to tell them that we had two bacon cheeseburgers. We only want to tell them we ate one because we're worried they might judge us, right? Um, and that's called interview bias. And so sometimes the phone can be helpful with that. People tend to be a slightly more honest. Um, but we can collect that data and then we can kind of just make some assessments. So what typically is, we use food models for households to measure. We get kind of pictures of estimates. Um, it is the least biased dietary data 
Um, the one thing with dietary data that gets hard is people tend to um, under predict how much food they ate. And so um, the 24 hour seems to be not as bad at that. With the 72 hour food diary, people tend to um, underestimate the type of calories that they eat and how many that they eat. So this just takes you um, a little bit through um, a three to seven day. Three to seven day gives us a lot more of a picture because I'm sure if someone asked you, well, what did you eat yesterday? Yesterday might have been a really light day of food, may have been a really heavy day of food, but not maybe a representation of what your whole week looks like. And so this is greater because it's a whole representation. Um, it helps that if there's a data system that people can enter their food into so they can be recording the whole time, but people do tend to underestimate um, their energy intake. In my nutrition class, when I have people actually do this assignment for three days, I tell them, you know, for example, if you're gonna eat, if you eat a bowl of cereal every morning, pour the bowl that you normally eat and then go back and measure it. Because when you just ask someone to measure their food, they just naturally start eating a little bit less because all of a sudden they realize, wow, granola is only in one fourth cup serving and that had 250 calories in it and I actually eat two cups of it. Well, who knew that that breakfast was so calorically dense? And so when they start measuring, they start changing their behavior unconsciously too. And so there is that risk. Okay, and, the, and then another diet assessment is a food frequency questionnaire. And you can kind of go through this as well. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and the diet history, again, using that three-day food record and that 24-hour recall um, can be structured. Um, it is used quite a bit and can be pretty helpful. Um, some of the problems with measurement error, and you do need to know these, observer bias, when the interviewer is not accurate in measuring or reporting participants' responses, um, that can be a problem. Certainly instrument bias, if um, the instrument has any errors, or there's an inaccurate member um, measurement, um, and there's a calibration of an instrument. A really good example of this is if you've ever had a skin full test at a gym. That has one of the largest instrument biases possible because the instrument is the human and the instrument is the actual instrument. And actually, most people can't do a skin fold very well. It's, a, it's something you have to be really practiced at. And so there's an inaccurate measurement because when you get your skin fold test, you gotta hope that everything is on point at that, pump, at that moment. Um, and then there's subject recall bias, um, and that's where um, there's a distortion between what people report and whether they're over-reporting or under-reporting, right? Like exercise is something that can be over-reported. I have a lot of people in my nutrition class will tell me, but they went on a, they went on a long walk with their dog. Well, that's super awesome, um, but if you tell me you went on an hour walk, but you only made it a mile, did you actually exercise? Not really, but but saying I went on an hour walk sounds really good. Um, so there is variability too. Um, and so go through what different possibilities there are with subject variability, instrument variability, and observer variability, and some of the solutions that we can come up with to solve those problems. Um, Differential reporting, we've kind of talked about a little bit already. We do tend to see um, someone who's been um, overweight versus normal weight individuals tend to report their food differently. Um, and it definitely obscures the association between diet exposure as well as disease outcomes. Um, so what have we learned? We've learned that uh, diet has a direct relationship with hypertension. Um, sodium and red processed meat. There's, there's just no question today um, that processed foods, processed meat, this is like every time you get a turkey, a ham, a bacon, anything like that, that's all processed. Even if they say there's no nitrite or nitrates, they occur naturally in celery root, which is what the natural products do. And so we, we absolutely know they raise blood pressure. We absolutely know that diets high in whole plant foods, grains, lower blood pressure. No questions asked. Okay. So what do we look like? You know, this is 2010 and we're already into 2020. What do we need to do? We, we need to be incorporating whole foods in our diet, right? So we say whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, but really it's leaning towards 
removing the processing of our packaged foods, leaning towards those whole whole grains, whole vegetables, um, minimal dairy. Um, dairy is kind of being moved out slowly. Um, lean proteins to no proteins um, coming from an animal. There's actually protein in all the food you eat, um, if you didn't know that. Um, actually, beans and rice have more protein than an animal does, um, and nuts and things like that. But certain foods remain on the list, but should be super minimal. Red processed meats, they are completely, you know, and this, as I said, this textbook is a little old. They're completely linked. Okay, so take a look at this is kind of what we just talked about. Um, and so let's get to the conclusion. Nutrition and cardiovascular disease, we know that there's a relationship. We need to continue to do studies because it's the number one killer in the developed world. Um, and so in given the fact that it's behavior-based tells us a lot about what we need to be doing differently. And then looking at how we find information to make sure that we're coming up with the right policy and the right educational tools to effectively prevent or limit the outcome of cardiovascular disease with everything that will come before that.